The semi-strong form of the efficient market hypothesis states that prices always incorporate the totality of all publicly available information, both past and present. Corollary to this is therefore the idea that risk-adjusted excess returns, alpha generation, to use the technical term, are a mirage, in their pursuit indistinguishable from the folly and futility of alchemy, or the search for the mythical metal of orichalcum. Market-beating results can therefore only be achieved by taking on more risk, and through sheer luck, never through skill. Generally speaking, the efficient market hypothesis is fairly well established, with its conclusions being validated by an inability on the part of both bedroom day traders and hedge fund tycoons alike to consistently beat to the S&P 500. However, even Burton Malkiel, the theory's most vocal supporter, would be willing to admit that enough gremlins lurk about the data to preclude its definite validation. In fact, a number of practitioners have either directly or indirectly called into question the supposed all-encompassing nature of the semi-strong form of the efficient market hypothesis. Perhaps the EMH works most of the time, but has a blind spot when it comes to binary outcomes. For example, either zero or moon, for assets like Bitcoin. Another possibility is that there could be a meaningful distinction between superficial, more easily digestible information and deep public information. Deep value plays make prime examples of outliers to the EMH, as markets tend to apply hyperbolic discounting to companies in a secular decline. GameStop is a good example of this, with both Keith Patrick Gill and Dr. Michael Burry correctly identifying the stock as a diamond in the rough. With the new PlayStation and Xbox consoles on the cusp of launch, GME had a plushy cash cushion and surprisingly robust sales figures of $5 billion in 2020 of all years. So while the Reddit run-up starting in late 2020 was probably somewhat decoupled from the fundamentals, the underlying thesis was correct and not at all baked into the stock price. What's more, this was not a split-second mispricing, but rather an arbitrage opportunity spanning over a year, available for the taking thanks to democratized access to trading platforms offered by companies like Robinhood. And this wasn't just a fluke, for Dr. Burry has been finding these opportunities for the past quarter century. In the early 2000s, for example, one such successful bet was the Avanti Corporation, by all metrics a profitable company, but one whose software contained purloined code. Corporate oversight also left much to be desired, and the overall sentiment when it came to the company was overwhelmingly negative, to the point that Bloomberg even ran a piece titled The Avanti Saga, Does Crime Pay? The company still ended up being acquired though, and Dr. Burry ultimately made anywhere between 7 to 10 times his initial investment. Like with GameStop, the binary nature of the bet precluded market efficiency from kicking in, because investors, perhaps understandably, thought that the company was done for. Other cases require a more intuitive approach, as opposed to a deep dive into metrics like a company's book value or price-to-sales ratio. A good example is Nikola Motors, which went public via merger with a SPAC, or what was previously known as a blank check company. This should have given investors cause for pause, given the checkered history of such listing vehicles. For one thing, the listing process via SPAC is much less rigorous than going public through the IPO route, and the sponsor gets what is called the promote which amounts to a large chunk of the company, usually around 20%, once the business combination is completed. The incentive is therefore to get the deal done, 
any concerns regarding the quality of the business subordinated to this primary goal of getting paid. Even Jordan Belfort, the Wolf of Wall Street of all people, once disparaged cryptocurrencies by comparing initial coin offerings to the blank check companies that were all the rage back when he was active in the industry. Second, if energy densities aren't ideal with electric vehicles, with battery OEMs allocating massive amounts of resources to R&D into all solid-state batteries and alternative cell chemistry, things get way more experimental when it comes to hydrogen-powered trucks. This naturally means more risk. On the flip side, it also means opportunity, so none of these factors were a definite deal-breaker by default. Provided that Trevor Milton, the CEO, and his team were up to the task, the company could very well have succeeded. The problem is that Milton unintentionally, but very clearly, communicated that he was not up to the task, in an interview back in April of 2019, a full 14 months before the stock's all-time high in June of 2020. He had this to say about the Nikola truck. The entire infotainment system is a HTML5 supercomputer. That's the standard language for computer programmers around the world, so using it lets us build our own chips, and HTML5 is very secure. Now, a programming language would be something like C, or Java, or Rust, or Python, etc., but never HTML5 which is a markup language used to structure and present content on a web browser. It's also not clear why its use would have any impact on Nikola's ability to build their own chips. This was a litmus test, in the sense that it's difficult to conceive of anyone well-versed in the natural sciences or engineering making such a pronouncement. Shorting the stock solely on the basis of this one interview would probably have been a bit of a stretch. For that, you'd need something more concrete, but you'd think that with this negative information floating about, semi-strong form market efficiency would kick in, precluding the stock price from growing ninefold before ending right back where it started, which is unfortunately exactly what ended up happening. Sometimes you can't even know for sure whether a given setup is an outlier exceeding the limits of the efficient market hypothesis, or whether everything just happened to align perfectly and one of the less likely scenarios came to pass. I happen to be a firm believer in Bitcoin, but the truth is that any point along its timeline can be used to illustrate this idea. Take the bear market of 2018 and early 2019, for example, when the price all but breached an important line of defense at $3,000. Assuming a 50% probability the price would either rise tenfold or drop by 90%, the Bernoullian expected value of a $1,000 bet would be 10,000 times 100 to the power of one half equals $1,000. However, it doesn't seem much of a leap to view a tenfold increase to $35,000 as being, for all intents and purposes, equal probable to a moonshot to $50,000. In this case, the expected value tilts in our favor thus. 14,000 times 100 to the power of one half equals approximately $1,200 or perhaps the quote-unquote real probability was a 10% chance of a surge to $50,000, and the stars just happened to align, allowing us to experience a path in the multiverse in which Bitcoin is not a long-forgotten fad along the lines of the fidget spinner, but rather a ubiquitous household name. The fact that its exponential price movements appear to follow the four-year halving cycle only deepens the plot. This, of course, on account of the public nature of Bitcoin's emission cycle, Satoshi Nakamoto having left an immutable, algorithmically defined roadmap extending all the way through to 2140. Information cannot get much more public than that, 